The next talk will be about a new variant of PMAC, Beyond the Birthday Bound, by Kanya Suda. Thank you. Uh, so this sentence pretty much summarizes what this work is all about. Um, this work provides you a, a new block cipher model operation, uh, which is uh, which looks uh, which is based on the previous construction called PMAC, and uh, the new model operation is highly secure and highly efficient. So uh, in the following, the rest of this talk, I'll explain what this uh, sentence really means. So first, I'll give you a brief introduction to uh, Mac. Then I'll uh, talk about block cipher-based uh, mode operation for message authentication clues, uh, focusing on uh, PMAC. Then I'll describe uh, what I mean by highly secure. Um, and here, highly secure means that construction achieves security uh, beyond the birthday bound. So I'll talk about birthday bound problems and uh, the security levels uh, higher than that. And lastly, uh, I'll describe uh, what I mean by highly efficient um, by uh, describing the uh, our construction itself and, and, and details. And I'll try to persuade you that it's actually efficient. And lastly, I'll, I'll uh, discuss some possible uh, improvements to the construction and some future work. Okay, so let's talk about. Um, Message of uh, Mac's uh, message authentication clues. Uh, it's Mac is a is a symmetric key primitive. Uh, takes uh, possibly large data and mixes it with your uh, secret key and produces small output. The output uh, value is called a tag, and the tag has a fixed length uh, output, unlike the input, uh, and, and the length is usually uh, very small, like 64 bit or 120 bit, etc. And, and the purpose of using Mac for your data is to ensure the integrity of your data. Okay, and there are uh, four ways to uh, uh, make a Mac. One is to design from scratch. Um, that gives you a, a dedicated Mac primitive. And a second is to utilize a uh, cryptographic hash function like MD5 or SHA-1. Uh, and uh, a well-known example of this type of construction is HMAC. And the third one is to uh, uh, construct your Mac from using a uh, universal hash function. Universal hash function is a mathematical object rather than a cryptographic object. Uh, uh, it has certain properties, but it, by combining it with, uh, with some cryptographic hash function, you can construct a secure Mac. And lastly, you can use a uh, block cipher. Uh, and examples include CMAC, the NIST standard, and PMAC. And of course, we uh, this work focuses on the last uh, method, block cipher-based construction. Okay, so uh, I'll talk more about block cipher-based uh, MAC constructions, uh, and uh, I'll also talk about the uh, uh, PMAC. Okay, so there are uh, two major uh, types of block cipher uh, mode operation used for message authentication code. One is um, CVC iteration, and uh, one is uh, uh, PMAC. The other one is PMAC uh, structure. A CVC iteration um, is uh, you basically you create. Uh, you, you, your data is, is, is partitioned into blocks, and you uh, iterate your uh, uh, encryption of your data, and you, but be, before you encrypt your, your, your uh, message block, you uh, extra the uh, previous output with your current message block. Then you encrypt that, and you repeat that till the end of your message, right, or till the end of your data. And whereas for PMAC, um, 
uh, you prepare a special value called the mask in advance. And, and this mask needs to be uh, updated uh, at each step. And um, before you encrypt your, mess uh, your data block, you extra with your data block with this incremented mask. Then you encrypt your, uh, your extra value with your block cipher. Then the, the uh, output value is extra altogether to uh, uh, go into the final, uh, final process. Okay. So, um, well, here's a, a very rough comparison between CBC uh, iteration and PMAC structure. Well, as you can see, CBC is inherently sequential, whereas uh, PMAC is parallelizable. Uh, it's, it's actually fully parallelizable. Uh, if you look at the uh, PMAC structure, the, these masks need to be updated, but they, they can uh, update itself. You, you don't have to look uh, the, the update, the updation of the incrementation of mask doesn't depend on your uh, on your data. So you can increment uh, your mask offline if you want. Sorry. Um, and if you look at the uh, extra operations uh, outside your block cipher, well, for CVC you only need extra operation, so that's pretty efficient. But for PMAC, uh, you, well, you need. For each block cipher call, uh, you need two XORs and mask implementation. Uh, usually mask implementation, mask update operation is, is, can be done pretty fast, but not as fast as XOR. So uh, that's a bit slower than just uh, XOR CB separation. So, I'm, well, I'm not gonna really uh, argue which one's better, but I'd like to emphasize that we choose PMAC here in this work because of uh, not performance reasons, but for uh, um, uh, provable security reasons. Um, seems like the PMAC, because of the parallel structure, uh, PMAC seems to have a structure easier to analyze than the uh, uh, CBC iteration. And in fact, some of our techniques uh, cannot be applied to a CBC iteration. So uh, let me explain what I mean by this. Uh, so, uh, well, this is the intuition behind this, uh, this feeling. Um, so when we do security proofs for this type of mode operation, we have to treat you know, various events uh, and evaluate uh, probability of these events happening. And if you look at the uh, CVC iteration, well, it's the, uh, it's sequential, so of course you have to execute your, mess, your data block in the order that, that's defined. And so the order of execution, execution there's no freedom in the order of the execution here. Whereas uh, for PMAC structure, uh, the construction is fully parallelizable. It means that um, usually you, uh, execute your uh, data block sequentially uh, from, uh, because that's, uh, um, that's, uh, that's the uh, most efficient way for mask implementation, but in security proofs, it really doesn't matter which data block you evaluate first. So, uh, and uh, this is really the uh, intuition behind uh, why PMAC has, seems to have a structure easier to analyze from the point of view of security proofs, of course. Okay, and then uh, I'll talk about birthday problems. Um, okay, so when, you, when we talk about max security of max, we, we usually talk about uh, we usually use the notion of unforgeability, uh, which means that the adversary, without knowing the key, should not be able to uh, produce uh, a, leg a, a valid tag value for, for, uh, for message, for new message, of course. Um, and then there's a stronger notion than unforgeability, which is uh, third randomness. And uh, as you can tell, the randomness uh, implies uh, unforgeability automatically. If it's fully random, looks random, then you can't predict it, so you can't produce uh, a valid tag. 
And so if a map construction is a secure uh, pseudorandom function, it's called PRF, then it's also a secure map. And this is the uh, direction that we follow in this work. Okay, so um, what is the birthday problem? Well, the birthday problem is, is essentially says that uh, if you use n-bit block, uh, block cipher for your uh, Mac, block cipher-based Mac construction, then you only get, um, you know, ha a half n-bit security, which means that, for example, for uh, six, using 64-bit block ciphers, you only get 32-bit security. If you use 120-bit block cipher, you only get 64-bit security. Um, and for, for 128 bit, this may not be a big problem, but for 64 bit block cipher, this is a big issue. And uh, two to the 32 blocks corresponds to the 32 gigabyte. And uh, well, we, we have 64 bit block cipher, not only the old ones, but also new ones, uh, you know, triple S, height, present, and LED. Um, well, of course, these are uh, either legacy ciphers or lightweight ciphers, and uh, it's, it's questionable whether 32 gigabyte is a, um, is a lightweight or not. But, as, but in any way, 32 gigabyte is, is, is just way, way too small. I mean, it's, it's too small a number to be a, to be a security guarantee. Okay, there are uh, two uh, different pro uh, birthday problems, two types of uh, birthday uh, problems that exist for block cipher-based multiplication. One is, uh, one is actually generic. It doesn't, it's not limited to a block cipher base, but it's also, it also applies to uh, any iterated max. And uh, essentially, there's the existing attack, existence, existentially uh, uh, forgery attack um, is possible for any uh, iterated max at the a si a half the size of the uh, state size. Well, the state size usually is the block size for block cipher based. So this is uh, one of the limitations, well, uh, this is one of the birthday problems. And, and uh, bad news for, for block cipher based uh, Mac is that for CVC type Mac, there, 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 there is even a stronger uh, attack uh, that can produce universal forgery. So this is really bad. And another uh, birthday problem that exists uh, for uh, PRP, uh, for block cipher based uh, mode operation is uh, so-called PRP, PRF switching lemma. Uh, block cipher is, is of course a permutation for a given key. And permutation is, is, is sometimes uh, not very easy to handle in security proofs. So what you do usually is to replace your uh, permutation with a function. And you say that, yeah, well, um, this is uh, secure. Uh, PRP means pseudo-random uh, permutation. Um, but, but, you know, let's just replace it with your, uh, with your PRF pseudo-random function. Well, you can do that, but only up to the uh, two to the uh, half the size of blocks are the queries. So this causes another uh, security degradation. Okay, so this is our security result. Our construction achieves, uh, unfortunately, not to the two to the n, but two to the uh, two n, uh, two thirds of n. And so, for for example, for 64-bit block ciphers, this corresponds to 42.7 uh, 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 bit security, uh, and, and that corresponds to 51 terabytes. That's a significant gain, and. Uh, um, uh, our Mac can be proven uh, to be a secure PRF based on the, uh, on the sole assumption that the underlying cipher is a, is a secure pseudorand permutation. So, of course, we don't uh, use, use the uh, switching lemma in our proofs. Okay, so let's uh, talk about our constructions. Okay, uh, before talking about our construction, I'll talk about some previous constructions that appears in the, uh, on a rather old standardization uh, document, uh, ISO 9797. And actually, there's, the ISO 9797 specifies several uh, algorithms, MAC algorithms, um, block cipher based all. Uh, and, and one of them actually achieves uh, security beyond the birthday bound. Uh, it's, it's, Slightly worse than our band, but it's close. It's, it's essentially the same to, uh, to the two to the two to third of man security. Uh, unfortunately, the problem with this algorithm in ISO 9797 is that it's slow. Uh, it's 
twice as low as the ordinary uh, uh, CBC or PMAC uh, max. So that's why it's called the rate, rate half construction. Um, so I, this, this uh, ISO 9797 algorithm is, is essentially a sum of two independent CBC max. So uh, basically you, uh, for the same message, for the, for, the, for the same data, you compute CBC max twice using independent keys, then you take the sum. Uh, and, 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 and the sum is your uh, final tag value. Um, of course, you have to do the CBC max twice, so that's this, this is just, uh, twice slower. Okay, so uh, we don't want this. We, we want, you know, rate one. Um, uh, by, by rate one, I mean for, for one block of your data, we only want to uh, call our block cipher only once. Uh, rate one construction. Uh, so uh, how to do this? Well, we don't want to double the block cycle call because that would immediately lead you to uh, uh, rate half construction. So, but we can double everything else. So uh, let's look at the original PMAC construction. Um, here's the PMAC construction. Uh, after doing the PMAC uh, iteration, we take, goes into some kind of uh, finalization, which is a special form of uh, block cipher call then produces a tag. Well, uh, the masks, let's double them. We use uh, two different uh, uh, masks and, and, and increment them in, in, a, in a different ways. Uh, block cipher calls, we don't touch them, but for the state size, we uh, double the state size. And of course, we can't just double them because that would produce the same two things. So uh, we have to some one is one state is just the XOR of all the outputs, but the other one must be uh, uh, computed in different ways, and, and we do a finite feed multiplication by two to do this trick. And I, and I apologize that this actually um, figure in the first version doesn't uh, describe this uh, correctly. That's just uh, it's it's wrong. So and the finalization. Uh, Let's double them. Well, this uh, increases your block cipher call because that's the, this requires two block cipher calls, but it only uh, at the finalization. So independent of your uh, uh, message block, this is just, just one extra block cipher call. So that's, it's not really, it doesn't uh, make it rate two. Then we just take the sum and that's the tag. So this is our construction. Okay, um, this is just uh, uh, how, how, uh, all the extra operations essentially uh, done outside the block cipher is the finite field multiplication by two or four, four by multiplication by four is just uh, you do the multiplication by two, two times. And it uses two keys, three keys, sorry. Um, one for the uh, internal PMAC iteration and, and two keys for the finalization. Um, and uh, as, as, you can, as you know, the final field multiplication by two can be uh, implemented quite uh, efficiently. It's just a one bit shift plus one conditional XOR. So that's pretty efficient. All right, so um, I'll talk about a couple of uh, possible improvements to the construction and, and some open problems related to them. Okay, so I said the construction requires three keys. Actually, we can uh, make it two key uh, without much uh, effort. Uh, we do this by, uh, for, for the finalization. Instead of uh, using two independent keys, we can use uh, the same key, except that now we have to do some uh, tweaking uh, in front of the uh, one of the finalization. But but that can be done by just say, uh, for example, multiplication by two. So so that's fine. But uh, you know, um, after this, uh, at the moment, we don't have ways to make it one key construction. Um, the, the independence between the keys of, of the, between the key of the uh, PMAC iteration and the key of the finalization seems essential in many places of the security proof, and we have uh, so far uh, no clue how to uh, make it one key. So this is an open problem. And um, another problem 
is that uh, the security, you know, two, three, two thirds of N. Um, so one idea is, you know, instead of doubling, why not just, uh, you know, triple everything? Well, uh, that may work, but uh, that, give, that doesn't give you uh, still two to the N. It only gives you two to the uh, three and over four at best. And you can do this four times, five times, but, you know, it doesn't give you two to the N security. Um, and, and plus, you know, just tripling or doing four times, five times, it gives you a, a very large state size. And, and you, you can still call it the rate one, but not practically efficient. And uh, another point is that uh, the, the bound may not be tight. You know, two to the third, uh, two to the two and over three. Uh, we don't know any attacks that uh, break our scheme at this uh, complexity or, and the proof may be improved. And thank you, that's, that's it. Wow, the next speaker is setting up. Any questions? Actually, we don't need the diagram. We have the two parallel masks being updated at the top. Um, to me, you know, you're XORing two things together. It's conceptually, it's just a really complicated update of one mask. So, does your proof actually rely on yeah. like the two yes. different? Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, uh, that's actually essential to to the uh, uh, to to obtain the security to be on the state bound um, because we have we need uh, two. Uh, two to the, we, we want two n bit randomness in, in evaluating our, our security because we have a, that's, and, and that's, that's how we introduce uh, two, two n bit uh, randomness in the input of the uh, PMA federation region. Okay, thank you. I'll have to read the paper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh. Uh, one more question. So the abundance of uh, source and linear operations here. Uh, give some intuition that the text that may exist between the bound you have proved and uh, two to the two n, uh, they might exploit some uh, linear combinations of inputs and outputs. Do you try some attacks of this kind, or do you have some non-trivial attacks that are in this gap? No, um, not really. I, I, I'm not quite sure uh, what's uh, you, you're talking about the gap between the full security and this bound. Well, um, not quite sure which. Uh, uh, well, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure how, how tight the bound is. So, I, I, and I haven't really explored any attacks, specific attacks. And we're really late. So, <laughs> Sorry. So, so maybe we um, yeah, yeah, we could take so. this uh, offline. Sorry about that. We're running five minutes late now. Um, so let's thank the speaker again. Okay, the next talk is about authenticated and misused resistant encryption of key dependent data. Uh, the paper is by Mihir Beleri and Suram Qvidi, and the speaker will be Suram Qvidi. Okay, uh, hello everyone, good evening. I'm Sriram, I'll be talking about authenticated encryption of key dependent data. This is joint work with Mihir Bilare. Classically, the security of encryption schemes has been captured by the indistinguishability under the chosen plain text attack, or the INTCPA notion of security. This was introduced by Goldwasser and Mikali in 84 in the public key setting, and later by Bilare and others in 97 in the symmetry key setting. Now, over time, we have gained a lot of confidence on INTCPA, and we would regard it as sufficient for many practical applications. But INDCPA comes with a caveat. Messages cannot depend on the key. Now, there are certain applications where we would like security even when the message depends on the key. If we had this kind of security, we could get anonymous credential schemes. This was shown by Kamenish and Lishanskia in 2001. A year later, Black, Rogway, and Shrimpton showed connections between key-dependent messages and formal methods in cryptography. Now, they model key-dependent messages by deriving the message from the key using a message-deriving function, phi. It turns out, apart from these applications, there are several practical settings in which key-dependent messages arise. Disk encryption tools, like BitLocker, uh, sometimes end up storing the key used for disk encryption on the disk itself. 
often these keys are derived from the user's passwords, uh, say with a hash function. And this password could be lying on the disk. And sometimes the hash of the password could also be lying somewhere on the disk. Because of concerns like these, the IEEE standards for disk encryption, uh, IEEE 1619, rejected one of the candidate schemes they were considering because that scheme had a prominent KDM attack. This is kind of an indication that KDM security is uh, important in practical concerns too. More generally, we cannot expect users or designers of systems to ensure that the key and the data are not related. Rather, we want to design crypto systems which are secure even when the key and the messages are uh, related to each other. And this is about misuse resistance and getting robust crypto systems. Anyway, coming back to the work of uh, BlackRock and Shimpton, they extended the standard indistinguishability under the chosen plain text attack, INDCPA, to consider uh, key dependent messages. They provide models, definitions, and they show that this notion, KDM CPA, uh, there, is a, there are schemes which are secure in this notion. They describe this, uh, the following random oracle model scheme. And subsequently, there has been a lot of work in KDM uh, about removing this random oracle and getting standard model schemes which are KDM secure. If you look at these schemes, we find that uh, they are usually, they consider security for restricted classes of message deriving functions and they are inefficient and impractical. On the other hand, uh, cryptographers have asked about the possibility of key dependent messages arising in other primitives. Halevi and Krochik consider the security of pseudo random permutations and pseudo random functions in the presence of key dependent messages. Uh, Backus, Pitzman, and Skedrow extended the CPA scheme of BlackRock and Shimpton to consider a basic form of authenticated encryption. In this work, we revisit key dependent messages in the setting of authenticated encryption. But we take a more comprehensive view and we focus on the practical aspects. Why? Because arguably for symmetric crypto, authenticated encryption is uh, the most important primitive going by the extent of usage. So we want to know what are the issues that arise when we think about key dependent messages in AE in a practical sense. So let's first take a look at authenticated encryption. This, there is no KDM here. This is standard authenticated encryption. Now, uh, the first thing to note is that unlike CPA, authenticated encryption not only guarantees the privacy of the message, but also its integrity. And if we look at uh, the, mo the model of authenticated encryption considered by Backus, Fitzman, and Skedrow, which we'll call classical AE, we see that the encryption scheme takes in a key and a message and a random IV. Now, in practice, authenticated encryption schemes are more complex. Not only do they have to deal with the message, they also have to deal with associated data in the form of a header. This header is also provided as an input to the encryption scheme. The interesting thing to note is that the scheme has to guarantee only the integrity of this header, not the privacy. Another change is that unlike uh, the classical AE, in modern schemes, there is no random IV. Instead, there is a nonce which is provided as input. This nonce does not have to be random. We'll come back to the nonce issue in a couple of slides. So uh, if we want to look at authenticated encryption and KDM in practice, this is the form of uh, AE we want to look at. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, authenticated encryption is an important practical primitive. So there are many standards talking about authenticated encryption schemes in um, mobile security, in IPsec, et cetera. And these standards consider AE schemes with a nonce and a header in this form. So now, if we bring in KDM, what are the issues that are going to, uh, that we have to handle? As always, the message can depend on the key. This is what KDM is about. But now, we also have a header, and the header can also depend on the key. Not just that, the, the nonce that is, the, that is given as an input to the encryption scheme does not have to be random. If the nonce is random, we are in one setting. This is the random nonce security setting. But there is another setting called universal non-security, where the encryption scheme is only, is only guaranteed a nonce that is unique, that is non-repeating. It could be from any source. For example, it could be a counter. Now, it's easy to see that universal non-security is more uh, attractive in practice. It's easier to maintain a counter than it is to maintain a source with good randomness or pseudo -random, good pseudo-random generator. Consequently, the standards that we saw on the previous slides, uh, sorry. The standards that we saw see here actually talk about authenticated encryption in the universal non-setting. Let me just go back there. 
Okay. So we have to we have to uh, we're starting to see that if we want to look at KDM in authenticated encryption, there are all these things we have to deal with: different kinds of nonces, messages, headers, etc. As a result, we're not looking at one object here, but we are actually looking at many variants. The message and the header could both be key dependent or not. And this already gives rise to four possibilities. And we also have random versus universal nonces. So we have to deal with eight possibilities in all, eight variants. And the natural question to ask is, can we get schemes, can we get secure schemes in all of these variants? Or can, can we at least, uh, so th th there is another issue here. So if we cannot get security in some of these schemes, can we at least uh, show that it's, it is not possible to achieve security? For example, can we show attacks that say that whatever uh, scheme is, uh, is there in a variant, the, the attack breaks the scheme? So one, th one thing is easy to do here. If the message and the header are both independent of the key, then we fall back to normal authenticated encryption. We know we can achieve this. We have standardized and secure schemes that achieve security in this setting. So let's look at the other variants. Now we have six variants in all. The message can be key dependent. The header can be key dependent, or both of them can be dependent on the key. And the nonce could again be random or universal. So in this work, we ask the question uh, if whether it is possible to achieve KDM security in these settings. Our first contribution is a simple and universal, uh, unified way to deal with all these variants so that we don't have to end up, uh, I mean, redoing some of the proofs and definitions, et cetera. And we show two attacks. Our first attack shows that with universal nonsense, it's not possible to get KDM security. Now, keep in mind that the standards that we saw all talked about authenticated encryption with universal nonsense. So what this means is that none of these standardized encryption scheme, authenticated encryption schemes can be extended to key dependent message security. This is already somewhat bad. And the other, other uh, attack that we show rules out key security in the presence of key dependent headers. So what is remaining? The, the only remaining setting is when the header is independent of the key and the nonce is random and the message still depends on the key. We show that it is possible to uh, achieve KDM security in this setting. Uh, our, our solution to this problem is a scheme, RHTE, randomized, hashed, and encrypt. RHTE actually uh, is not a standalone scheme. It's a transform. It takes a normal authenticated encryption scheme and transforms it into one, which is secure uh, when the, in, in this setting. And it's a very lightweight, simple transform. It's, uh, it has minimal computational overhead. And we, we show that there, is, there are no extra elements being added to the ciphertext, so the overhead and bandwidth is also zero. And it's a, it, it can be thought of as some sort of a software patch that can be applied to a system to make it KDM secure. And we show that RHD is secure in the metamorical model. Okay, so in the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll be focusing more on the uh, results that I just mentioned, the two attacks and, uh, and the RHD. So to look at these attacks, we should, I should first define KDM security and before I do that, let's just quickly recall authenticated encryption security. So, uh, in fact, one of our contributions in this paper is to come up with a simple no novel authentication encryption security definition. But I won't go into that in the detail here. I'll just look at this from a very high level so that we can make sense of the atta attacks that we will describe later. So when we want to describe the security of a scheme, we think of a game between a challenger and an adversary. And in the beginning of the game, the challenger uh, chooses a random bit B and a key K. This is authenticated encryption security, so the adversary can make both encryption and decryption queries. So when the adversary makes an encryption query, depending on whether this B, B was chosen to be one or zero, the challenger is going to reply either with real encryptions or random bits. There is one, one thing to note here of interest, that is, if we are talking about universal non-security, the adversary gets to provide the nonce that will be used for encryption. But if you're talking about random non-security, this is not allowed. The challenger will choose its own nonces randomly. This will play an important role in the attack. Other than that, the adversary can make decryption queries, and if the decryption query corresponds to a valid uh, ciphertext, then the adversary will get back a, a one, otherwise it'll get a zero. This is if the bit B is one. If bit B is zero, then the adversary will always get invalid decryption. The aim of the adversary is to find this bit B. 
if we, if we talk about KDM security, the basic structure of the game remains the same. The only difference is that now encryption queries, rather than taking in a, a, a message as an argument, now have a description of a function, a message deriving function fee. And the challenger will evaluate this fee on the key to get the message. Everything else remains the same. OK, so now let's look at our, uh, the first attack. Uh, recall that what we're saying here is if, we are, if the authenticated encryption scheme does not get random nonces, but gets nonces from some arbitrary, non-repeating source, then it's not possible to have KDM security. The starting point of our attack is uh, an earlier attack that was presented by BlackRock, Wayne Shrimpton. And their attack was on uh, stateful encryption schemes. So before we, uh, we uh, dive into the attack, let's, let me just give a high-level idea of what's going on here. The adversary, uh, it, it, if you're in, in the universal non setting, the adversary gets to provide the nonce. We saw this earlier. So one of the start strategies of the adversary could be to embed this nonce in the message deriving function fee. Recall that fee is evaluated by the challenger on the key. So fee knows both the nonce and the key. In other words, fee can simulate the encryption of uh, random messages. So here's a high level idea of what the adversary could do. The aim of the adversary here is to get just one bit of the key, k of one. And what it's going to do is choose a random nonce, an arbitrary nonce, and another random string s, and embed them both as part of fee's description. And fee's job is to, fee knows the key, fee is going to be evaluated on the key. So fee's job is to somehow find k1 and communicate it back to the adversary. So how can fee do this? The only thing fee can do is output a message, and this message will subsequently get encrypted and the ciphertext will be given to the adversary. So fee does this following thing. Fee, fee just random, arbitrarily chooses different messages, tries encrypting them, and checks if the dot product of S and the ciphertext is the same as the bit of the key. Once fee finds such a message, it stops and outputs this message. The challenger now takes this message and encrypts it and gets the same ciphertext that fee got and returns the ciphertext to the adversary. What can the adversary do? It already knows S. It knows that S dot product of S and this ciphertext is the same as the first bit of the key. So it can just recover that bit. In fact, the adversary can repeat this for all the bits of the key and recover the key completely. This attack seems to work, but there's one problem. We don't know how long evaluating this, I mean, how long phi will run for. We don't know when phi will find such an M that satisfies this property. So we can fix this, it's easy to fix. The only thing to do is to make sure that fee stops eventually when it realizes that it has gone for too long. So we, we do this by you know, pu putting a bound on the running time of fee, saying that it can only try L times, where L is a parameter that we provide to the adversary. If fee does not find a required message within L times, it's going to just output some arbitrary message. And instead of a dot product, we are now going to look at a, a family of pairwise independent hash functions. So we can show that this works. I'll not go into the details. We can show that uh, if we choose L to be comparable to the number of bits in the key, then we'll get an adversary which recovers the key with a high probability. So let's stop for a second and see what we have done here. So this attack is somewhat serious because we are not just distinguishing between B equal to zero and B equal to one, we are actually recovering the key. And maybe this attack is artificial, but it still rules out the possibility of getting schemes that are secure with universal nonces. We have a similar attack in the paper that, that shows how it is not, I mean, how in the presence of KDM, key dependent headers, it's not possible to get security. But I'll skip that attack here in the interest of time. So what do these mean? What do, the, what do these two negative results mean for us? When we go back to the table of variants that we started off with, we see that whenever we, see, whenever we have universal nonsense, it's no longer possible to get security. And similarly, whenever we have key-dependent headers, again, it is not possible to get security. So the, the most important takeaway is that standardized schemes require universal nonsense, and we can't get KDM security in these settings. This is rather sad. So what is left to do? The only variant where we can still hope to get secure schemes is with random nonces, key independent headers, and key dependent messages. And we show that this can be achieved uh, by our scheme randomize hash then encrypt. So uh, our scheme is actually a transform. It takes an existing uh, authenticated encryption scheme and con con converts it into a scheme that is 
uh, secure in this in the, in the setting we, we saw earlier. And internally, it uses a hash function. So this is what it looks like. It, uh, if you look at the new encryption scheme, it takes in a key L, a nonce R, a header H, and a message M. And from this key L and the nonce R, it generates a new temporary key K. This is interesting because every time the encryption routine is called, a new key will be generated. And this new key is what is going to be used for encryption. It, uh, it will be fed to the encryption routine along with the header and the message. The decryption proceeds in a natural manner. Assuming this works, it's easy to validate all the properties we claimed earlier. Minimal computational overhead because the only extra thing we're doing here is making a call to a cryptographic hash function like SHA-1. Now, these things are notoriously fast in practice. When we ran experiments with CCM for the base authenticated encryption scheme and SHA-1 for the hash function, we found that the overhead due to this whole process was less than 1% uh, when the message was 50 KB or larger. And zero bandwidth overhead, because anyway, for authenticated encryption schemes, we need a nonce. And the only thing we are doing here is using the nonce in a different manner. Instead of feeding it to the encryption scheme, we are using the nonce to generate a key. Similarly, simple software changes. We can just think of uh, a patch that makes a call to a random oracle before actually running the encryption routine. OK, so that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you. We have some time for questions. Okay, no questions, so let's thank the speaker.